Mm, hello. I'd like to read a little bit from Ross Poldark. It's at the beginning of chapter 17 and it's about De Melzer in the library. I just adore these little snippets, these quiet times spent by De Melzer at Nampara. So here we go. It's from Oh, there's so much shine tonight on my book. It's from Winston Graham, and it's by Winston Graham. It's from Ross Duck, and it's the beginning of chapter 17. In the growth of de Melzer's intelligence, one room at Nampara played a distinctive part. That room was the library. It had taken her a long time to overcome her distrust of the gaunt and dusty lumber room, a distrust which derived from the one night she had spent in it, or beside the great box bed. She had found afterwards that the second door in that bedroom led through into the library, and some of the fear of that first hour stuck to the room beyond the second door. But fear and fascination are yoke fellows, oxen out of step but pulling in the same direction, and once inside the room, she was never tired of returning to it. Since his return, Ross had shunned the place, because every article in it brought back memories of his childhood, and of his mother and father, and their voices and thoughts, and forgotten hopes. For de Melza, there were no memories, only discoveries. Half of the articles she had never seen before, for some of them, even her ingenious brain could not invent a use, and so long as she could not read the piled yellow papers and the little signs and labels scrawled and tied on certain articles were no help. There was the figurehead of the Mary Buckingham, which had come ashore, Judd told her, in 1760, three days after Ross was born. She liked tracing the carving of this with her finger. There was the engraved sea chest from the little fore and aft schooner which had broken its back on Damsel Point, drifted upon Hendrona Beach and darkened the sands and sand hills with coal dust for weeks afterwards. There were samples of tin and copper ore, many of them lacking labels and all useless anyhow. There were spare strips of canvas for patching sails, and four iron-bound chests of whose contents she could only guess. There was a grandfather clock, with some of its insides missing. She spent hours over this, with the weights and wheels, trying to discover how it could have worked. There was a coat of mail armour, terribly rusty and antique, two rag dolls, and a homemade rocking horse, six or seven useless muskets, a spinet which had once belonged to Grace, two French snuff boxes, and a music box, a roll of moth eaten tapestry from some other ship, a miner's pick and shovel, a storm lantern, a half keg of blasting powder, a sketch map pinned on the wall of the extent of Grambler Workings in 1765. Of all the discoveries, the most exciting to her were the spinet and the music box. One day, after an hour's tinkering, she persuaded the music box to work, and it played two thin trembling minuets. In excitement and triumph, she danced all around the instrument on one leg, and Garrick, thinking this a new game, jumped round too, and bit a piece out of her skirt. Then, when the music was over, she hurriedly went and hid in a corner, lest someone should have heard it, and come and find them there. A greater discovery was the spinet, but this had the drawback that she could not make it play a tune. Once or twice, when she was sure there was no one about, she ventured to try, and the sounds fascinated her, even when they were discordant. She found herself perversely taken with such sounds, and wanting to hear them again and again. One day she discovered that the farther her fingers moved to the right, the thinner became the sound, and this seemed to give the puzzle away. She felt it would be much simpler to conjure tunes out of 
out of this than to make sense of the horribly spidery trails that people called writing.